Well, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you and you and you and you. It's good to see all of you. This is the day the Lord has made. That's always that song. It's just, I was just singing it up here. We need to remember that when we get up in the morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We just to be glad in this. So why don't we be glad in this? Stand, open in a word, in a, not in a word, but in a word of songs. How's that? Please stand and join the praise team. for you it's Psalm 89 1 it says I will sing of the goodness and loving kindness of the Lord forever with my mouth I will make known your faithfulness from generation to generation I approach the throne of glory Nothing in my hands I bring But the promise of acceptance From a good and gracious King I will give to you my burden your strength come and fill me with your spirit as I sing to you this praise you deserve the greater glory overcome I lift my voice to the king in of nothing empty friend and I rejoice cause you deserve the greater glory overcome with joy I sing by your love I am accepted you're a good 
that you would see me as your child and as your friend safe secure in you forever I pour out my praise again cause you deserve the greater glory someone's house, you know, you're going to visit someone's house, they're a good friend, you know you can just show up empty-handed. I, I love it. You go to someone, you don't, you don't, I, I have to bring something. But sometimes you can show up, it's just all good. There's just going to be love there. It doesn't make any difference, you know. You're just going to have some tuna fish sandwiches and hang out. I tell you what, we did that with a couple years ago, right? They're lifelong friends. They came to our house. We had no food. We had tuna fish sandwiches living in Hyde Park. They came empty-handed. Fortunately, our cabinets weren't totally empty, but, uh, it was good. Hey, give each other a wave. Be glad that you can be here, folks. I'm glad that you're here. And then grab yourself, grab yourself a seat. Grab yourself a seat. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Bye-bye. Joseph. You're going down to Junior Church? All right. Okay. Just the children. No adults going down to follow the munchkins. You're stuck with me. So, good morning again. It's good to be here. Calvary Baptist Church in Dedham, Massachusetts in the year 2022. Got it right. I think we're in June, and it's looking good. It's looking good. So, this message is entitled, Sign, Sign, Everywhere a Sign. And I realized afterwards that this does harken back to a 1971 rock song, okay? Just being up front, okay? I didn't mean it. I'm not trying to go rock and roll, but, you know, if you go back, it was a song that's been stuck in my head since then and it won't go away, it's okay. I'm not gonna die, neither are you. But signs, signs are really important. This week, I, uh, we got a phone call from, a, a, from a, a food bank group, and they said there was food down at Fidelity Investments, downtown Boston. So I, I you know, go to my GPS, I go to 254 Summer Street, Boston, I know the address now, and, uh, and I'm listening to my GPS. But you know, as I drove all through Boston, going through there, I was still looking at signs. I pay attention to those signs just in case the GPS is wrong, right? It just is. And signs, 
You know, we, we were just talking about this. Want to go to a soccer game later today. Serena and Siana are playing. It's funny, the way we pay attention to the weather, don't we? Don't we pay attention to the weather? It's kind of funny. It's just in the background. It's a sign to us. Look at this. It's going to be cloudy. It's going to be this. You know in the winter when it's really cold and it gets really gray? You say, oh, we're going to get snow. This is a sign there. We're looking for signs all the time. So we're going to talk about another one of the signs that Jesus did, since that he did. And we're going to take a look at this. We're going to be in John chapter 4. We're going to take a couple of bites at this. Folks, I hope I didn't bite too much, okay? Because I, I want to get to the end of chapter 4, so I hope I didn't just put too much into this message that I leave your brain just discombobulated, okay? But hopefully you'll recover from it at least. But uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to read some of this text for us, get ourselves going here, and uh, well, so we'll take another couple of bites. We will. It starts off in John chapter 4, verses 39 to 42. I'll read those for you. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed him because of the word the woman testified. He told me all things I ever did. And this woman kept saying to them, Jesus said everything I ever did. He kept saying that. She kept saying that. So the Samaritans had come to him. And they urged him to stay with them two days. And he stayed, with, stayed there two more days. And many more believed because of his own words. Then he said to the woman, then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, but we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. See, an amazing thing that takes place there, those Samaritans, they say, they know this is Christ, the Savior of the world. That's very, very important for us to keep in mind. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you for the, the time to be here, Lord. Father, please help all of us, myself included, to park our brains from everything that's going on outside this world. Just park it, Lord. Put it in a parking lot. Let us just hear your word and be contemplated on. And even the words I have to say, Lord, let my brothers and sisters be led to have other thoughts about your word because it's so important. We thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, so striking thing about this entire event with the Samaritan woman, okay? Think about this. Think about this. This great event in Sychar there, God uses an outcast woman to be an evangelist to these men. That's who he uses, an outcast woman. She's the evangelist, okay? She's, she's there. She's proclaiming Messiah. All the cultural norms and statuses, they're out the window when the Holy Spirit is in control. When the Holy Spirit is in control of us, there's a lot of power involved. There really is. There really is. I believe she believed. She didn't respond didn't repeat a, a sinner's prayer, did she? She didn't ask forgiveness the way that we might think. See, God knows our hearts already. We can't fake it. We just can't. Okay? She, she practiced what Jesus had done. Remember, Jesus went to her, then she went to the city, didn't she? Yeah. Perhaps this is what we call a Key performance indicator. And we hear this in business all the time. Key performance indicators. Well, that's an interesting thought. Perhaps her going was a key performance indicator of her spiritual condition. Of her spiritual condition. She did what Jesus did, right? We don't see a list of refined uh, elements of attributes of sanctification with her, do we? Right? You don't see it, okay? You don't at all. If you think about it, you know, she's not singing on the praise team, but she should, right? She's not teaching Sunday school. Maybe she will. She does no normal church services, does she? Well, there was no normal church yet. Acts hadn't happened. The church as we know it, and we sort of have contrived it, didn't exist yet. So she couldn't do those. She just went. She just went. Remember, she dropped her water buckets, and she just went. She did exactly what Jesus will command his disciples to do in Matthew 28, 28 18. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's what he told us to do. He told us his disciples to do that. Go is a continual action. It's go. It's going. It's not go and stop. It's keep going. I get it. We need to take a nap and all those things. I, I appreciate that. But think about this. Millions of people talk as if Jesus is real, but they act as if he's not. As always, our actual position determines by, is determined by the way we act, not by the way we talk. 
Say what you want to say, but do what you say. Okay, she was doing it. Too many people have what we call, a, I call, a pseudo-faith. Verbally, the person of pseudo-faith, they can give you their statement of faith and the decree. They can just talk, right? I believe, rah, 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 rah. They believe it, and they've got a story to tell you, and you're saying, that's compelling. These people, they got it together. And it can, I'm not saying to talk, you should declare your faith. I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about a person of pseudo-faith here, okay? However, a person of pseudo-faith will never allow themselves to get into a predicament where they, where they would have themselves dependent on their statement of faith, okay? They maintain a safety valve all the time, just in case God falls asleep on them or something. Uh, just saying how it is. Each of us is coming to a time when we have nothing but God. Our health, wealth, friends, even our hiding places will be swept away from us. We'll only have God. Like this Samaritan woman, right? She had nothing. She had nothing. She had no place to hide in that little village. And everyone knew her business, whatever it was. We're never told explicitly everything she did wrong. We just told she had five husbands and the guy she's living with now, but we don't know everything, okay? Let's not throw too many stones here. But to a person of pseudo-faith, it's a terrifying thought not to be in control. To the person of faith, if your focus is on God, you'll know you'll have burdens. You'll know you'll have trials. But you'll know that God's in control. That is what's so vital. Let's not be people of pseudo-faith. God can use the most unlikely and unworthy person to be his tool of choice. Unworthy? It's interesting, huh? How do we determine that unworthy, right? She's unworthy. Really? Slow down. <laughs> Slow down a little bit, okay? Unworthy. Because, you know, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. You know, there's times when we really feel like, we feel like the hammer of God, don't we, right? i got a hammer up here, folks. I was home looking for my Thor hammer. I've got a Thor hammer. Yeah, I do. It's, and it's, it's, it's foam at the head, and I throw it, and it's fun. But I have a Thor hammer. But I have a hammer here. I have a hammer here, okay? The hammer of Thor, that's called Mjolnir. I even got the name of it. You know, if you want to speak Norse, you get your, this is my Mjolnir. Well, it's not. It's just a hammer. But if you think about it, hammers, uh, we're sort of like the head of the hammer, right? And we're attached to a handle. Sort of like we're the branches attached to the vine, huh? We need to be attached to something. So a little thing about, little physics lessons about this, okay? A hammer with no handle, right? If I want to drive this nail into the pulpit, it's oak. This is going to be hard, right? So if I just use the head, it's going to be really hard, isn't it? Yeah, it is. However, if I put a handle on it, right, and a longer handle even, and you have a strong arm, well, now you have force equals mass times acceleration. So based on the length of this handle and the strength of my arm, right, I can get this nail and I can whack it into the pulpit, right into the wood and wreck it. I never do. It's oak, it's beautiful. But the point being is, the handle is what's powering the head. That's where the power comes from. And I th see this woman, and I see the power she had. She was completely powered by Christ, the handle. By ourselves, we're nothing. But when the Holy Spirit is working in us, like it was working in this woman, it's amazing. Think about being used by God and who God used uses, right? He used a Samaritan woman. That's who he used. It's amazing. See, many believed him because of the words that she testified. Many did. Many did. But just look at the apostles, folks. Peter, he was a brawler. He was a piece of work, right? Matthew, he was a lover of money. He's a tax collector. Love your money, honey. Give it to me, right? Simon the Zealot. I always, I said this last week, so I think Simon the Zealot was a thug. I just think he was a thug. He was a zealot. He was a street fighter. He was against Rome. God used him. How about James and John? The sons of thunder. A couple of real egotistical guys, weren't they? Think about it. Let us be about right by your side ahead of everyone. That's not exactly the team you pick out to be a championship team, huh? I don't think they'd play on the Celtics. Celtics still got a chance, folks. Don't worry. They do. They're OK. Really. But you see, we're just like those guys until he changes us. Do you get that? He changes us. 
In choosing the 12 disciples, Jesus didn't choose philosophers, brilliant writers, debaters, teachers, orators, or men of any distinction, okay? Many of any distinction. They were a motley crew. Just face it, they just were. They became great spiritual leaders under the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus didn't choose the equipped. He equipped those who chose him. It's a famous statement. I don't know who ever made it, but we need to keep that in our minds. The apostles, they were people just like us. They could have been seated in these pews, right? They're just people. Say, not me. Well, of course, they weren't the ones that were going to be chosen either. Certainly Peter, you know, he was a foul-mouthed fisherman. That's who Jesus chose. You know, that word, I can't, comes from our lips far too easily. I can't. For me, I can't is because I want to do something else. My I can't is selfish so often. I'm just being transparent. The world always says to be transparent. You know when you come in here, you get transparent and say, I don't care. I don't care. I'll be transparent. I can't so much. Sometimes you can't. I get it. It just happens. But usually it's because I want to do something else or I don't want to do what you want me to do. <laughs> I can't. That's amazing, right? I say this to you because I say it to myself. And I'm not here to massage you. I'm here to give you a message. So if that I can't reflects with you, good. I'm not here to massage you. I love you. I want you to have the message. Her words didn't save them, but they served to direct them to Messiah and the, whose name that they could be saved. Notice that woman's focus. Whenever she spoke about Jesus, it was always what he said about me. She didn't proclaim anything about herself. It was amazing. It was always what he said about me. And the men did not denigrate the woman by saying that uh, they believed, and whether it was or not because of your testimony, no, no. Testimony is a tool that God uses through us. You need to remember that. That's important for us to come to that. To know Jesus, we have to come to Jesus on our own. See, her account was compelling. It really was, okay? And she was way out of character, probably. Think about it. So they wanted to confirm her account, didn't they? Verification happens. Think about it. When Mary Magdalene came from the tomb back to the upper room to tell the disciples, the apostles there, what did Peter and John do? They booked, they ran to the tomb. Tomb's empty, he's risen, what? They went and verified it. That's not a bad thing. Verification is an important thing to do. Because sometimes it takes a period of time something to sink into our minds. Expecting people to trust what we might call the risen Savior is a big deal. It just is. When you know Christ, it seems, well, it's like tying your shoes, right? Of course. But it's hard. You know, if, someone, if you tell someone about Christ and they just believe you, if they just, oh, I believe that, A, they probably don't understand what they're believing, or B, they just want you to go away. Oh, I believe you. Have a nice day. I'm trying to get rid of you. I'm just saying, it's just not that easy. Because if it was that easy, well, the pews would be full, wouldn't it? Just saying. I'm just saying. And verse 40 says, so the Samaritans had come to him. They urged him to stay with him. And he stayed two days. And many more believed because of his words. You just got to see the scenario. The city of Sychar, all these people, they came to Jesus. Okay, they're down in the city someplace. They come to Jacob's well to see him. Jacob, Jacob's well is a common ancestor between the Jews and the, and the Samaritans, okay? But the city empties out to there. They're coming, these Samaritans are coming to see a Jewish rabbi. That's just pretty whacked out, okay? These people didn't get along. That's where they were. I imagine Jesus continued on as he told the Samaritan woman, you need to worship in spirit and truth. It wasn't about Mount Gerasim. It wasn't about the Temple Mount. Uh-uh, spirit and truth. It doesn't say it, but I'm certain he was clarifying that in great depth, in great depth. We have some spirit, don't we? And we have some truth in our worship. We got them both. But think of all the other things that creep into our worship. Huh? Don't they? Things that op occupy our minds that perhaps sit side by side with the truths that we know, right? Don't we have mind battles? Don't you have mind battles? Don't you? I have them all the time. 
I'm the pastor. Look out. I'm the I get mind battles all the time about faith. It happens all the time. You know, worship is more than just coming to church. This is the easy part, folks. You came here this morning, you got up, you brushed your teeth, yada, yada, you came here, and you sat down. You haven't had to really do much, right? I mean, think about it. This part of it is really cinchy. I just got to tell you, it just is. Simplest thing we can do, just show up. But I think about the spiritual decisions that I make at times that are not so spiritual. My doubts creep in. Do your doubts creep in sometimes, too? Do they? You know what's classic I hear people say all the time? How could God allow this to happen? All the time. Joanna's host, she's giving me the face, and she knows it, right? How could God allow this to happen? You hear this stuff. I heard it yesterday. Just yesterday. It's true. It's amazing. That creates doubts for many people. How could God allow this to happen? It just creeps in. In that case, it leaps in. It doesn't creep in, okay? We deflect from self so easily, and it seems that we have God silently take the blame. Think about it. God's just taking the blame for us. How could he allow that to happen? How could we allow it to happen? That's what we should look at in the church and societally. societally how do we allow these things to happen? Whatever it is, fill in the event yourself. I don't care what it is. There's so much that happens. What did she say to these people? This, this, she, to, the, to those men? Look, I love this Samaritan woman. I could stay here forever. I'm going to, we're going to get out of Samaria in just a few minutes. This woman is phenomenal in the Bible. But she said to these men, could this be the Christ? Have you ever asked anyone that question? Have you asked any question? Is this the Christ? I'm not talking about being confrontational. Don't get in someone's face irritating and debating. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Okay? Jesus did that with the religious leaders. Okay? So if there's going to be a, a battle, if something to be a debate, let me do it with a religious leader, OK? Just leave it at that. And I'm not going to, because I don't have time for them. I have time for lost world, not religious leaders. Sorry. That's how it's going to be about. But uh, just think about it. Could this be the Christ? When I say that, so that you will hear what they believe. That's important. We need to listen to what people do. More importantly is to have a person speak and hear for themselves what they believe, OK? Do they know? Do they know who Christ is? Who is Christ? Is there a Christ? That's a great question. Is there a Christ? If there is no Christ, then what is it? People need to become the reality to hear those questions and answer them for themselves. Don't assume that anyone understands who Christ is. Because we live in a world that's the antithesis of the Christian model of Christ's model. Because she ran to them, many believe, but not all. So then Jesus has been in Samaria, and he finally goes to Galilee. He gets out. He's in Galilee. Let me read for you verses 43 to 48. After two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Interesting statement. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen the things he did did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they had also gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made water to wine. And there a certain nobleman who was, whose son was sick at Capernaum was there. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea, he went to him, imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. So Jesus is done with his short little stay in Samaria. Remember, Jesus is staying, if he was there, in the house of Samaritans. The people that hated each other, radical. Just keep that in mind, OK? Those people you might not like, <laughs> maybe need to stay over their house for a while. I don't know. But Jesus makes this comment out of the blue, it seems. A prophet has no honor in his own country. And that has significance later on in this, because this is all going to happen in his hometown. In Matthew 13, in 57, it says, but Jesus said to them, a prophet has no honor except in his own, a, a, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many works there because of their unbelief. That's in his hometown. He had no honor there. He didn't do many signs and wonders. He didn't do nothing because of their unbelief. And in Luke chapter 4, 
the same instance going on there when he revealed who he was in his hometown, the people who knew him, they rejected him. They ran him out of town. They tried to throw him off a cliff. That's what they tried to do. Is that any different for us today? I'm not saying that we're prophets, but we can proclaim the truth of God's word. And no one's trying to run us off a cliff, okay? But believing in Jesus, as he would have us believe, it will distinguish your life. Everyone wants to be distinguished, right? Look at me. Look at me. I'm distinguished. But a life that's distinguished by Jesus differs because God gets the glory. I don't get the glory, you know? Uh, like, you know, boom, he hit the three-pointer. He looks really good. It was so frustrating. A little bit of the Celtics game I watched. Steph Curry, like, nailed two or three of them, and he ran down the court going, ah, he's so good. Ah, oh, look at me. That's just another reason for me to vote against those guys. But anyway, so much of the focus on ourselves. But as a Christian, it's not about us. The God gets the glory. God's going to get the glory. It's opposites. So when a person comes to Christ, stepping out of the world and trust Jesus with words and actions, the first attacks usually come from their family and friends. Right? Jesus said no honor in his hometown. Your family and friends can be the worst. What's all this talk about Jesus? What are you doing? Hey, are you hanging out with a cult? If you knew what I do about those people, right? Just think about things people say. You know what we believe. And you think back, right? Because if you know Christ, and, you, and, and someone in your family or friends say, you know what we believe, you stop and you think, you go, yeah. We, we, we don't believe anything. <laughs> right? Isn't that what it usually is? Pseudo-faith. We don't believe anything. Pseudo-faith. We're running our mouths, but our hands aren't doing nothing. Neither are our feet. Our actions don't do that. We say light dispels darkness, and that sounds real good. I've been saying it all the time, don't I? Pete's always said, light dispels darkness, light dispels darkness. Rah, rah, rah. That's good. That's nice. Okay? And I'm going to tell people about Jesus. They'll be in the light too. But that's not exactly what Jesus said. I know. I'm contradicting myself. Shoot me. In John 16, Jesus said, in me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. When you're being in light, you're going to get tribulation. And that stinks because I'm in the world. So that means I'm going to have tribulation. Not only will there be no honor at times for us, but Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, doesn't say that he's going to bail us out of trouble either. It's not going to happen, right? It doesn't happen. Paul was stoned. Peter was flogged. Stephen was stoned to death. Jesus didn't bail him out, did he? Jesus promises to give us peace in times of trouble. There's going to be trouble. There just is. In John 17, 15, it says, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Okay? That's Jesus speaking to the Father. There's no beam me up. Get me out of here, Scotty. That's not how it works, okay? That would be against the request of Jesus to the Father. Think about that for a minute. Just think about that. Let that sink in. If you are in the light, you will be in a fight. We need to stop with the Jesus take me home. We really do. I'm going to tell you right now, I hope I'm not hurting your feelings, but that's self-focused. That's all about me. I know this pain. You don't think I get pain? I get pain sometimes, folks, from family and friends and all sorts of ways. We're all the same. We share all the same stuff. Don't think you're individuals. You're not. <laughs> you're not. We all got the same stuff happening here. And the apostles were never recorded as saying, oh, Jesus, just take me home. But this day, the Galileans, they greeted Jesus because they were all at the Passover. It was cool. They saw what Jesus did. This is great. He's a hometown hero. This is our Jesus. He did those things down there that no one else can do. This is all good, right? Okay. It's cool for the moment. But this is sort of in his first year of ministry. At the end of his second year of ministry, you know that part where I said they're going to run him off a cliff? Yeah. These same people are going to try and run him off a cliff. Not so cool, huh? I don't think so. That's why he said there's no honor for a prophet in his own country. Though Jesus turned that water to wine in Galilee, only a few select knew, knew about that, right? Water to wine, only a very few select people knew about that. The only crowd that really knows who Jesus is are the Samaritans right now, if you think about it, right? What do we say in verse 42? What do the Samaritan men say to Jesus and to the woman? We know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. 
Messiah, he was Messiah to them. The Samaritans had a one-up on all the other world, all whole world. Think about that. That's a group of people saying, we know this is Messiah. First time you hear that in the Bible. It is. So what happens? This nobleman in this text comes to Jesus. This nobleman. That, you know, the, he, this man of means comes before Jesus. This nobleman comes before an unemployed carpenter. You ever think about that? That's Jesus. He's an unemployed carpenter. The nobleman comes before him. It's, and it's interesting when you start looking at this. You know how I love maps, okay? So the nobleman, he comes. This is the Sea of Galilee, right? Or the Sea of Tiberias. He's in Capernaum, and he travels down to Canaan. Not trivial. Okay, none of these travels are trivial. But his son's dying. His son's dying. And I want you to just note something here, because Jesus is left. He's now getting to here. Usually what happened, if you were traveling from Judea up to here, I've said this before, but it's so important. You would have gone on the east side of the Jordan River, crossed over through the Jezreel Valley, and you go to Canaan. No feet going into Samaria. It's a dirty place. Not my neighborhood. Jesus and the apostles, or disciples, they were coming right up out of Samaria into Galilee, into Galilee to Canaan. They came right up. What's my point? Here's my point. I wonder if anyone saw them coming out of Samaria. I wonder if anyone saw them coming out of the wrong neighborhood. Right? You know how people a lot can be? That's where they came from. I find it so interesting. The seven signs or miracles recorded in John's Gospel. The healing of this man is the second sign after turning water to wine. But why perform these signs? Why are they recorded? And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in his name. What an incredible statement. So many other things he did. That's why it says that if everything Jesus did, the books would fill up the world. Many others were done. But this is all you need. All we need is right here. All we've been given, okay? That's all we need. The signs were not entertainment. If you recall, when Jesus was brought before Herod later on at the trial, right? Herod, when, when, when the, he said, come on, Jesus, do some signs for me. Entertain me, right? Jesus didn't have anything to do with him. It wasn't entertainment. These are signs. Jesus left no doubt. Jesus even empowers his apostles with the ability to do the signs that prove who Christ is. The only reason people didn't believe what they saw was the hardness of their own hearts. Rejecting God. A hard heart is a self-centered heart. Not a popular thing to say, huh? You don't understand me. You know, I can't understand everything. I'm not God. But a hard heart is a self-centered heart. It's all focused in there. Part of my job, part of your job, is to help someone's heart get soft, right? In Ezekiel it says, God will give them a heart of flesh. Take that heart of stone out. Really there. God is the God of your life, or you are the God of your life. Right? We were responsible for coming into this world at all. And we have no control over when we're going to leave, nor what happens after we leave. Let's not candy coat the circumstances or the rationalizations why people don't believe. The Samaritan woman didn't. She said, he knew everything about me. All their worst. You see, it's rejection every time. And when you, when you need an excuse, anyone will do, right? I just love that statement. It's gonna, I'm going to have it, you know, someday. If I don't get raptured, it's going to be on my tombstone. If you need an excuse, anyone will do. We're so full of excuses. The rich young ruler, he had an excuse, right? Follow me, Jesus says. I can't. I'd have to leave everything. For a person that's poor, I can't follow Jesus. God gave me a bad rap. Why do I want to follow him? He put me in this predicament. People have so many excuses for not believing. You know what those might say? If you knew what I knew about what goes on in that church, you'd never go in there. You, I can imagine people say that about our church, right? Could you imagine how like silly that thought is? It's, as I've been saying the past few weeks, it's pure prejudice. Why don't you come hear what we're saying? Hear what I'm saying now. There's nothing magical. You can get someone to say it better, but it's loving. It's real. It's what it is. An excuse that we have for not giving. Well, you don't understand. I got, I got to take care of my family. <laughs> hey, I got a thought for us. Why don't we give according to how's God, under God's plan? 
Maybe it's God's plan for taking care of your family is superior to yours. Radical thought, huh? An excuse for not showing compassion. I was in a hurry. I couldn't give him, uh, give him a ride. I just didn't have time. What happens at a time when you need a ride yourself? How about an excuse for not having a kind word? <laughs> Who has time to do that? Besides, they'll think I'm weird if I say that. Praise God for the weird. Nope, with all those things, I just kept on coming down to the most simplest thing, a kind word. A kind word. Let's start at a kind word to people. A kind word. See where that takes you. See where that takes you. The issue still stands now and then that people are proclaiming truths. Jesus settled the issue with signs. As Nicodemus said, no one can do these signs unless, unless God is with them. Nicodemus made it clear, right? This is beyond any person. It is of God. I think Jesus may have said disappointingly in verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. You know when you say you people, that's in some cases right now, you, know, you should never say that to someone, you people. That's a dividing line. You people, you people, that's like, oh yeah, oh yeah. You don't say you people. You know, you say, we need to talk about this. Let's be inclusive. You people is a very, it's not a good way to go. But uh, the nobleman had come from Capernaum, a long trip for his son. The nobleman, that would have made him one of Herod's, on Herod's uh, payroll. Do you realize that? Because, oh, nobleman. We throw these terms around. What makes him noble? Well, he had to be working for Herod some kind. Because Herod was the nobility of Galilee. Yeah, Herod Antipas. So let's think about this. Herod Antipas, as I just mentioned earlier at Jesus' uh, trial, is going to heckle Jesus, right? Herod Antipas is the one who's going to have John the Baptist beheaded. And his grandfather, Herod the Great, would have all those children under the age of two killed trying to get hit his rival, Jesus. Now the nobleman's coming to Jesus. Tells you something about the power of these signs, doesn't it? It sure does. Power of signs. Herod's crowd didn't care a lot about God. They liked the temple because it was a cool place to hang out. Temple must have been incredible, right? I mean, you know, sometimes you just want to go someplace. It's cool, I'm here, right? What do you do? I don't know, but I'm here. Yeah, and I'm hanging out with these guys. I'll get an autograph. I'll sign it for you. I'll sign your autograph. You'll get a peak cane. You know, I don't know. But everyone claims to have the truth. What happens when two truths conflict? How do we discern who is the truth? Because it's no different today. It really isn't. I want you to think. We are barraged with so many issues. You know, what's best? What's the truth? What about these things? They're all tangential issues that we get hit with continuously. Take, for example, <laughs> what's your best skincare product? What's your best hair care product? This is the best way to lose weight. Trust me, this is it, OK? What about air pollution? This is how we're going to solve it. I've got an energy problem. We're going to solve it this way. Education, well, clearly, education needs to be on this way. Transportation, space exploration, it goes on. My point being is we spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out the truth and the best of all these things. I think sometimes, because our priorities are off, the power of the Holy Spirit is simply washed out, it's wrung out, and it's left out. Because we're trying to deal with all these other things. Where's our priority list? Don't you think if we could get this Holy Spirit at the top, these other things might take care of themselves? We close down with these last few verses. In John 4, verses 49 to 54. The nobleman said, Sir, come down before my, son, my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he, spoke, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servant met him and told him, saying, your son lives. It's incredible. Then he inquired of him the hour when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the 17th hour, the spirit left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour that Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole house. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea to Galilee. So to see the nature of faith here. Beliefs and signs and wonders must not be mistaken for true faith, okay? 
Jesus didn't encourage it. Remember that I said in Matthew 13? No one believed. He didn't do any signs there. What so important were they? No, they weren't. They weren't. Signs here are a model, folks. Healing the nobleman's son that Jesus does. We would call it, he healed him from a distance, didn't he? That's really cool. There wasn't like any of the healing things. Don't watch them on the internet. I've only seen one or two. Don't watch them. Don't go search these up. But people are healing, and they're putting hands on people and robes on people and doing these things. And people are getting healed and doing this. The wriggling on the ground. No. Jesus just healed them instantaneously. He did it. That's how it worked. If someone does get healed that way, you praise God. Because God could do that. But I don't think healing happens that way now. I don't think it does. Now, it may in some part of the world. I just want to tell you now, the Holy Spirit can manifest however the Holy Spirit chooses in any part of the world. We have zero control of that, okay? Keep that in mind. God is in control. God is in control. Signs of a certain value as a starting point. They make us aware of the reality of God. That's what Nicodemus said, right? He can only do these things if it was of God. Signs are sterile unless they point to Christ and to whose glory they signify. That's what the signs were all about. Like turning the water to wine. In John 2, 11, this is the beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. His disciples believed in him because they saw the signs. Signs did what signs do. They point to a destination. That's what a sign does. At the destination, no signs required. You're there. You know you're there. Your faith is fulfilled in Christ. It's a no-so trust that we have in Christ. Unquestioning faith that still allows us to ask questions. I have faith in Christ, and I question things in the Bible all the time. And I pray that you read your Bible and you question them too. And you bring them to me and you bring them to studies. Because it's a wonderful thing to do, to be in the word of God and asking questions. Because other things get revealed. That progression of this nobleman, as we close down here in verse 48. The nobleman came. He was seeking a sign, wasn't he? He wanted his son healed. He needed a miracle. In verse 50, Jesus tells him that his son lives. And the man, he believes him. He takes Jesus as his word. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went away. It's cool. But in verse 53, it's so good because the belief gets cemented. I think this is so cool that it goes through here. It says, so the father knew, so, so the father knew that it was the same hour which Jesus said that your son lives. He himself believed in his whole household. Isn't that cool? He even got that revealed to him. He even got that revealed to him. Are there some signs pointing in your life, pointing in my life? Is the Holy Spirit working someplace that we need to pay attention to the signs? We need to be careful that we don't become blind to the signs, or we think the signs are inconvenient. And we get an I can't. And I can't. I don't like my I can'ts. My wife tells me at times, Pete, you've got to sometimes stop doing that. Slow down. Someone else can. I can't. That's a good I can't, though. I don't know. The man and his son are used by God to demonstrate the power of one of these seven signs in God, John's gospel. You know, we never know how our story is going to impact someone. But God will do whatever he chooses to get our attention. If it's suffering that's required to soften our hearts, you better get a crying towel out. I'm just telling you. God didn't stop at the death of his own son. He temporarily stopped the death of this young, young boy, right? So that this miracle, this sign could be manifested. But what we do, what we say, we all have a story, folks. We write our story based on what we say and what we do. Like that Samaritan woman. I love her so much. Who are we going to? Who we go to or we don't go to is an indicator of our spiritual condition. That's a self-evaluation. It's a key performance indicator. Who are we going to? Because we're commanded to go to people. The Samaritan woman would have had excuses galore, wouldn't she, for not going to people. 
She was just stepped on and walked on. But you know, it made no matter to her. She had the truth. Just like that old hammer Thor, she was powered. But she was powered by God. Let's let God's power work in us so we step up by faith and do whatever it is he has called us to do. It's a good sign when we're doing that. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for those that are here. Father, I, I pray if this message will be of worth to anyone out there, Lord, on the Internet, that they will hear this message and they will understand who you are because of the signs that you did. You're so good to us, Lord. I praise you for everything that you do, Lord. Even what hurts, Lord, I thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a sign. Sign up. Is anyone any good plans today? Anyone doing anything good? Hey, we are. Kathleen and Mara and I, we're going shopping for, for, for furniture out back in, 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 in the fellowship room. Yeah, we're just going crazy. You know, pretty soon I'm going to be asking some of these, like real soon, we're going to be we're doing some deconstruction out there. So I need some people to show up with some hammers. I got one. And some bars. We're going to be uh, doing some stuff out back real soon, so I want to keep that in mind. But we have to take an offering. The offering plates are down here. Uh, if we have that, is that the, the, uh, once again, the, the, the contactless giving. I love, is it contactless? Did you love that contactless? It is contactless. You push a button and the money goes. And it goes into the pot in a different place. And then we go and we give money to the missionaries, which is always cool. It's always cool. And we find other works with things that we can do. So just please keep that in mind. But I have a few other announcements for you here. A few other announcements. Oh, I'm a little crazy here. Men's Bible studies tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. You can be here or you can get online. That will go out. We'll, we'll, we'll have the men's Bible study. Uh, so uh, for the food pantry, uh, it, it was a good time. The food pantry is progressing. I do want to suggest to you, you know, the little things that you can do, okay? Please, when you do shopping during the week, look, I'm trying to hit you up for more money and more stuff, right? Do a little shopping that can go into the pantry. It's so important. I tell you, it, it, when we do these little things, it helps change our hearts. We look outside, you know? I was out there the other day, this woman... She's so excited. She was getting box and box after pasta, just pasta. It was so good. She's so excited. And I had that opportunity this week. If, you ever, if I get a call, I don't know if anyone's available. I got a call. As I did go down to Fidelity in, in, in Investments, I got all this food down there. And it was so much fun to stop at the different pantries, put it in. When I was, just so you know, folks, this is the reality. When I was at one of the pantries, I couldn't get the stuff out of the car fast enough. People were swarming all over me for food. Literally, less than three miles from here, for real. I had to sort of like say, hold back. <laughs> I had to get a little demonstrative with them. But it all worked out. It was all good. And I gave them all, I gave them all cards, invited them to church and stuff, but they went there. So food pantry is there. We're working on that. Uh, that's there. Uh, fellowships. That's a fellowship room. I put the couch in there. We picked out the couch. I put it in there. You can't tell the exact color, but just so you know what, it's comfy. Right, Kathleen? We sat in that bad boy, it's comfy. We're gonna get one, maybe two of those and other chairs. We wanna change the complexion out there. We wanna have time, so if we wanna have meetings and do things, we'll have a nice space for it, okay? There's things to do. We need to have fellowship and, and a way for other people to be willing to come in. And also in the fall to watch football games and you can invite people to watch a football game here. Yeah, I'm serious. We live our lives, let's live them together. Just, I don't know if we're going to have time, but that breakfast is going to be January 20, uh, June, June 22nd. If you need information, if you can go to that, let me know. For Danny Croach, for his, his ministry down there. Uh, VBS, just so you know, Eric Briscoe contacted me this week. He has 15 people coming from Michigan to help us with our vacation Bible school. 15 people coming. And I spoke to the town, to uh, carry more at the town at the uh, Dedham Housing. They're excited to have us. They just says, Send me the flyer, they'll post it every place. So people want us, folks. They want us. Imagine that. Even me, they want.